So I'm going to continue um, from the series that we started last Sunday. And we started talking about being willing and obedient. Okay? So this is part two. And it's um, kind of has, a, that's the main title, but the subtitle is being willing and obedient, trusting the Lord. Right? We kind of touched on this last Sunday. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about trusting the Lord. Because when we don't trust the Lord, that's when we disobey. All right? So let's go over to Isaiah chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 2. So Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Is everybody there? Amen. Amen. And it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doeth not know. My people doeth not consider. And so this is the cause of everything evil that is going on in the earth, is rebellion and disobedience. And it all started back in the garden. In Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, <laughs> you know, we looked at that last week about how Adam and Eve disobeyed God. God gave them a direct order, right? Yes. He told them, do not eat from the tree of the garden, in the garden, in the middle of the garden, which is good and evil. But don't eat of that. That's mine. You can have anything else. If one tree. He's, he just asked for one tree. <laughs> And then, but who came? Satan came, mm -hmm. and he tempted them in the very thing that God told them not to do. Has he changed? No. no. <laughs> not in the least, okay? Mm -hmm. He's still doing it. He's always talking to you about the very thing that God talks to you about, right? Just like when Pastor Eric, God told him, you're a permanent resident, you are a U.S. citizen. Actually, he never said permanent resident. He always said U.S. citizen. That's right. Always, you are a U.S. citizen. It's already done. But the devil's coming in. You're not going to get the papers. You're not going to get the money. Yep. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Look at how expensive it is. How are you going to get the money? Yep. Yeah. So, and I remember <laughs> he was sitting in the back. And they had finally gotten totaled all the fees and everything, the lawyer fees, and then the fees to get the fees and all of this stuff. And it was like 6,000 plus, you know, dollars. And um, so they finally get that number and Eric is in the back in the pastor's office and he's sitting on the couch and he's just kind of like this. And as I go in there and I go, what's going on? <laughs> he's like, nothing, I'm just, just praying. You know, we got the total and it's a lot of money. And, and I go, yeah, that's a lot of money. <laughs> you know, how much you got saved up? Not that much money, you know? <laughs> and so the Lord was already speaking to me, and I said, well, you know what, Eric? Your church family's going to help you. Amen. So we're going to help you pay your lawyer fees. And he just started crying. Mm -hmm. Now, God is so good. And see, if you just stay faithful and you just stay watch, looking at him, looking at his word, okay? And you just, no matter what the devil says, you always go back to this word, right? Refresh your mind to what the word of God is saying. Refresh your mind to what the Lord is telling you, and you stay focused on that, it will come to pass. Will, I don't care, man, woman, black, white, I don't care. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? We use a lot of things in the world to make excuses of why we're not making it. No, you just need to kick that door down and go, uh-uh. God said there's a door here. There's a door. So God said I can go through it. I'm going through it. So, uh-uh, devil. Shut up. Shut up. Too many of you guys are entertaining the devil too much. You're looking at your natural circumstances and saying, oh, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Stop looking in the natural and start talking to God. Start talking to your daddy. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. So, going back to Genesis. If man had never disobeyed God, never rebelled against God, this world would have no sin in it. Yes. Right? 
Right. Yeah. You know, there would have never been the curse at all. And so all of this chaos that's going on in this world is not the will of God. Many people will tell you, oh, God is in control, right? God is in control of everything in this earth. Well, if God is in control, he has it a mess, right? Mm -hmm. No, if God is in control of everything, come on, let's logically think about this. If God is in control of every single little thing, then he has it in a mess. That would mean that God is in control of both evil and good. And that is not true. That's not true. He gave man free will. And he did it from the very beginning, right? Yes. By placing the tree in the garden and telling Adam, which is mankind, that was both female and male, right? He was telling them, he told them you can eat of anything in the garden but this one tree. That was ensuring free will. Because if that tree was not there, then they would be obeying him because they simply had no other option to. Yeah. Right? But if you ever wonder, why is the kind of God put the tree there? <laughs> That's why. Free will. And so it is your decision, it's your choice whether you're going to obey and listen to the Lord or not. Right? We have a choice whether we're going to be willing and obedient or rebellious and disobedient. Okay? And so the results of sin all right, is not the will of God because sin is not the will of God. And so what the devil does is he tries to get everyone on the earth to believe that God is responsible for everything. But Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom, that whatever you bind up will be bound and whatever you loose will be loose. So do we have some things that we got to do here on earth? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's not just going to fall on us like ripe cherries. A lot of people have this, you know, self-deception that, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. It should be perfect. My life should be perfect. No. Jesus didn't say that. He said, in this world, you're going to have tribulations. So that right there is like, what? What? Do you mean, Lord? what? <laughs> I accepted you as my Lord and Savior. I don't want to have tribulations. But Jesus said, no, in this world, you will have tribulations, but... See, that but just cancels out everything before it. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of its harm to hurt you. Yes. That's the Amplified version. Classic. Mm -hmm. I like that version. Mm -hmm. right? But see, we got to step into what the Lord has provided for us. Okay? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Woo. Freak. Oh no. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Hallelujah. And see, one of the problems, and this is one of the reasons why the devil comes around wanting you to doubt God, wanting you to not trust God, is because if you don't trust the Lord, if you question him at every turn, then you're not going to turn to him as the answer. Yes. When he is the answer. This is why the devil tries to come and talk to you and tell you, oh, that's not going to work. Come on. That's not going to work. Pastor, she doesn't know what she's talking about. It's just, you can ignore that. That's not what the Bible really means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, don't be so legalistic. <laughs> These are all things that people say. Mm -hmm. you know? Right? God's not a schizophrenic God. No. <laughs> no. He's not. Well, let me, cause if you think that God is going around doing evil and then also doing good, don't you think, it's like, then how can we go to him? Like, is he having a good day today or not having a good day today? I mean, we're going to go to him in prayer going, Hey, Lord, how are you feeling today? I just want, you know. No, he's not like your earthly father. We all know. Some of y'all know, you know, where you go, oh, how is 
dad today? Did he have a good day at work today? Or not a good day at work today? And you can kind of tell as soon as he walks in, oh, he had a bad day today, don't talk to dad, you know? <laughs> but see, that's how, if, if we are Christians, if we are believers, we should have good days all day, every day, no matter what happens, when we walk into the house, it's joy. Yes. There's a smile on your face because you're, it's good to be home. Yes. And if it's not good to be home, then you need to get on your knees and you need to ask the Lord, why isn't it good at home? Come on. What's my part? Yep. Stop blaming your family. Stop blaming your kids. Stop blaming your wife. Stop blaming your husband. Because mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. your house is chaotic. Mm -hmm. No, you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. Right? That you've got all power in heaven and earth living on the inside of you. The anointing that is on your life will change your household. Yeah. But are you releasing it? Or are you just complaining? Okay. It's quiet. Okay. It's quiet. All right. The Lord changes not. Right? He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He changes not. So if God doesn't change, who needs to change? We do. We do. We do. We need to change. All right? Now, let's go down to verse 19. Okay. We're going to read verse 19 and 20. We're still in Isaiah chapter 1. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel... Ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So you can see there's a cause and effect here. If you do this, then this is going to happen. All right? Mm -hmm. So if you are willing and obedient, what's going to happen? Good. You're going to eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, what's going to happen? You'll be devoured with the sword. You'll be destroyed, pretty much. And a lot of it is self-destruction, okay? <laughs> self-destruction. So does it make a difference if we're willing and obedient or if we refuse and rebel? Does it make a difference? Yes. Yes. Does, do you see that? Yes. Okay, because everybody's kind of looking like, oh, no. Let's read it again, all right? If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Okay? This is prophecy that is being spoken. Right? Isaiah was a prophet. This is not the law. This is the rhema word of God that has been written down for you. This applies to us still today. Yeah. Yeah. This is prophecy. Uh, when the Lord told me that, no, because it's like, uh, you know, because there's a lot of things. There's a lot of people, well, that's in the Old Testament. No, no, if we're reading out of the prophets, this was prophetic word being spoken out the pe to the people of God. Amen. Right? And so it still matters today. Yes. He's still speaking it out today. Prophetic yes. words don't just go away. Right? They are still alive today. Right? So this still applies to us today. If you're willing, and obedient, you'll eat the what? If you refuse and rebel, what? You'll be devoured by the sword. Right? So it makes a difference. Right? It makes a difference if we're willing and obedient or if we refuse and rebel. Do you see that? Yes. Have you seen that in your life? Yes. yes. When God told you to do, told you to do something and you were willing and obedient, how did it work out for you? Right. It was good. When you refused and rebelled, what happened? No. Not so good. <laughs> you know, not so good. <laughs> yeah. And see, what, what happens is people are missing it because they're thinking that obedience doesn't matter. Right? Why? Well, because we get off. We get off on righteousness and we think, well, Jesus paid for everything. He took care of all of my sin. He took care of it. Past, present, and future. It's all under the blood. It's all under the blood. We are not talking about justification here. 
right? The blood of Jesus justified you back to Christ, to, to the Lord, mm-hmm. right? So that gives you permission to go into the presence of God without the sense of guilt, inferiority, or shame, yeah. all right? So obedience is not referring to justification, okay? What obedience is doing is that it puts you on the path that God has for you because he has prepared things for you, all right? He's prepared things in advance for you. And so when he tells you to do something, he's trying to get you on that path so that you can receive the blessings, right? So you can go through the doors that he has provided for you. And a lot of times we, uh, bad things are happening and it's not God's fault. We're going through trouble when we shouldn't be going through trouble. And it's because we're refusing and rebelling. When we should be willing and obedient to do what God is asking us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to say this again because I really want you to get this. Obedience is not talking about justification. Right? It's not, what's justification? Justification is declaring of a person to be just or righteous. Justification is the declaring of a person to be just or righteous. All right? We are not justified by doing works or by obedience. All right? You are justified by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Right? You get that. Say this with me. I am am justified justified by the blood of Jesus. Jesus. My obedience obedience puts me on God's path. path. So I can receive what he's already prepared for me. So I can receive what he's already prepared for me. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. To say that your life will be good and that you will enjoy the full blessing of the Lord when you have hardened your heart, when you are stubborn, or you are not listening to the Lord and doing what he says because it's all under grace, is not true. It's not true. You have to access grace with faith. Right? You have to access grace with faith. We are saved by grace through faith, right? That's Romans 5, 2, right? So you access the grace through the faith, all right? And faith without actions is not living faith, right? And so when you believe, right, you will obey. If you refuse to obey, it means you don't believe, you don't trust. Now let me give you a quick definition of faith. The definition of faith is Hebrews 11.1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen, right? So Hebrews 11.1. So the quick definition of faith is trust. It's actually a firm trust. It's confidence, Mm -hmm. right? It's being fully persuaded, right? So if we don't trust the Lord, if we don't have that firm trust, if we are not confident, if we are not fully persuaded that when God speaks to us, it is God, he's speaking to us and that we should do it. If we don't have that faith, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And so a lot of times people rebel against God because they don't believe him. Yes. They don't believe his word. They don't trust him. They don't trust that God is going to do what he's telling us, telling us to do, that it's going to work out, right? So like I said earlier, today we're going to talk about trusting the Lord, right? Because when we looked at Isaiah, we see willing and obedient. Willingness has to deal with the heart, right? That's your attitude, Okay? And obedience has to deal with the follow-through. So if you look in Isaiah 119, it says, if you are willing and obedient, the two go together. You cannot separate. It's not willing or obedient. It's willing and obedient. Okay? So last week, We looked at the Greek definition of obedience in Hebrews 2, verse 8. So 
So let's go over there because I believe that this is probably the best definition for us to work off of because it's the obedience of Jesus. And Jesus is our example, okay? So let's go over to Philippians chapter 2. Glory, glory, glory. I'm going to read verse 7, and then I'm going to read 8. The 7 is good, too. Hebrew, oh, not Hebrews, sorry. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Well, let's go back up to 6. Mm -hmm. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Right? Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Right? Now, before Jesus could obey, he had to do what? Trust. No. What did he have to do? Read, read the scripture. 7. What did he have to do? Made himself of no reputation. Verse 8. And being made found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let me ask the question again. Before Jesus could obey the Lord, what did he have to do? He humbled himself. He humbled himself. In order for you to become a servant, you have to humble yourself. Because you're serving people. You're not serving yourself. You're serving people. So he had to humble himself. Humbleness is of the heart. This is the attitude in which Jesus humbled, you know, he humbled himself. He became meek, all right? Let's, well, let's look at the definition of humble in the Greek, all right? To humble, to be lowly, to be willing to stoop to any measure that is needed, right? And so humbleness is referring back to the attitude of the heart. And this leads us back to Isaiah 119, willing, okay? The flesh doesn't want to become humble or put anyone else before it. True, true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's all, if I, if I don't take care of myself, then who's gonna take care of me? Mm -hmm. No, if I do this for them, then what am I gonna get? That's, that's the flesh, mm -hmm. right? That's what's out in this world. Yeah, well, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We always want to do things for people just so that they, one day they'll do something for us. You know, you ever done that? Hey, hey, man. Hey, man, remember when I helped you with your car? <laughs> you know? I need a favor. You know, you owe me. You owe me. That is not so as Christians. No, that is not so as Christians. No. No one owes you anything. Because right? everything is found in Jesus. So even if, see, this is what we have to really renew our mind in, is that when we've sowed seeds to help people, people are going to help us in a time of need. It might not be the people that we've helped, and that's okay. Because they still might not be in a place to help. But God will provide. He will provide. Get your eyes off of people and onto the Lord. See, the reason why you feel like, well, nobody's helping me, nobody, is because you have your eyes on certain people and you think, well, I did this for them and they should help me instead of keeping your eyes on the Lord and God is going to bring those that are going to help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't do things for people so that, in, you know, in the future I, I need a favor. <laughs> no. No. And I told you guys a few months ago, um, I had to go get some blood tests done, and I um, drove into the curb of, a car, of the sidewalk, and it wasn't like a normal curb, it was a storm drain. Yeah. So it was like sharp, and my tire just blew out. Mm -hmm. Man. And I was like, well, that's not good. <laughs> and I'm just like, I just got this tire fixed. So I was like, okay. Right. So I just pull in, and I'm checking the time, and I go, okay, well, you know what? I gotta go get this done. So let me just go get this done. 
and then I'll just deal with this. <laughs> you know, I didn't cry, and I go, oh God, why me, Lord? You know, none of that. It was just like, all right, I'm here, I made it, let me go get it done, and then let me deal with this. All right, now I've never changed a tire in my life. The last time I had a flat tire, my dad came and changed it. <laughs> but my dad doesn't live here in St. Louis, so I could have called my dad. <laughs> Say, Daddy, can you come help me? You know? No. Nope. So I'm like, okay. I said, Lord, I'm a smart woman. I'm strong. <laughs> Maybe, I think. <laughs> um, I have a phone. There's YouTube on my phone. I can figure this out. <laughs> I can figure this out. I am very, I have a master's degree. Come on. <laughs> so I open up my trunk <laughs> and I get the tie. There's a, a bolt on the tie that holds it down and I unloosen that. Great, all right, good progress. I found all the tools, all right. And the jack is over here on the side. I don't know who put this jack in. But it was like Superman had tightened this thing. And I'm like, like, like I pull on the string? Oh, God, come on, man. I was like, come on, seriously? I'm like, okay. And to the side of me, there's this gentleman. He's sitting in his car, and he's like looking on his phone. So I, obviously, he's waiting for somebody. And I'm like, Lord, I don't really want to bother this guy. Come on. And I was just like, I had no choice. I was like, okay, I'm sorry. And I was like, Excuse me. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry to bother you, but I have a flat tire, and can you just help me get the jack out? And he's like, hey, this man jumped out of his car. He's like, oh, no, no, no. let me help you. Don't, you, you just stand right there. I will get it. I'm not going to let a lady change her own tire. Jesus. Like, oh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So he took that jack, he put that tire on, and the only thing he had to do was get air in it, and I was just like, thank you. He had wipes in his car, you know, for his fingers and stuff like that. Got dirty, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then his partner came out, and you know, we started talking, and I was like, he's helping me with your car, thank you so much for waiting, you know. <laughs> And like, at the end, I just gave him a big hug. I was like, thank you so much. I was like, God bless you. I was like, you know? I mean, I was like, and I was praying for the Lord bless them. I don't care what their situation is. You bless them in the name of Jesus. You just bless them. You know, I was like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and it took me a while to get home. It took me a while to find air that didn't cost money, free air. Right. Oh, my God. And then, you know, then to drive, and I was like, oh my gosh. But, you know, see, if you're willing and obedient, because I, I was asking the Lord the whole time. I was like, Lord, what should I do? He's like, you need to ask that man. And I knew before, because he was there before I even went into the building. And I got, and I just kept getting, you gotta ask him, you gotta ask him. I was like, I don't wanna bother this guy, I don't know who this guy is, this is a stranger. And I was like, uh uh. No, if you're willing and obedient, what's gonna happen? Gonna eat the good of the land. See, I gotta trust the Lord that this guy is okay. Amen. He's not a rapist and a murderer. <laughs> you know, you're gonna be all right. You're in public, okay? You know karate. <laughs> I took my combat class. I, I can, you know, defend myself. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You've gotta be willing. But we've gotta humble ourselves. Now, I had to humble myself and ask for help. Sometimes that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. No. Because we, we think, well, I've got to have it all together. I, gotta, I should know this. Well, you know what? I may have not known how to change a tire. That wasn't the problem. I couldn't get the bolt off. So it didn't matter. It wouldn't have even mattered if I could change a tire. I couldn't get the bolt off to get the jack. And if I had not trusted the Lord and not humbled myself, right, and did what the Lord was telling me to do, I'd still be in that parking lot. <laughs> and I'm thinking, who can I call? Okay, er Eric is like the closest. Uh, I don't know if he can change a tire though. I know Steve, Steve might. And so I'm like going through the Rolodex of all the men in the church, you know, but I'm like downtown Central West End, and I'm like, oh man, it's gonna be like. No, God had provision. Come on. He had provision there. Mm -hmm. God will always help you in your time of need. Yeah. Always you got to trust him. Amen? Amen? Right? So the 
flesh doesn't always want to be humble. The flesh doesn't always want to put other people before itself. Yet Jesus humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that was not a good death, right? It, it was brutal. It was beyond brutal. Right? He, he was beaten beyond recognition. They didn't even know, after they beat him, you couldn't tell if that was a man or not. You know, we, have, we have movies you know, that kind of give, the passion is probably, maybe the closest, but that doesn't even come and compare to what really happened. You know, we look at that and go, oh my gosh, but he was not recognizable. That was the power of God working. Because I'm sure if you talk to any medical professional, no man would have been able to survive that beating. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's what he did, he took for us. He humbled himself, right? So when we look at the word obedient in this context, in Philippians 2, 8, we see that Jesus was not looking at this as a pleasurable experience, right? In order for him to humble himself, Jesus had to deliberately obey. He had to make the choice to obey. We think, oh, Jesus, he is fully God, fully man. It's easy. No, 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 no. He came in the flesh. He was tempted in all points, just like a man, right? But he had to lean on the Lord. He had to trust the Lord in what the Lord was telling him to do. He had to trust the Lord. When the Lord said, no, this is my will. You, you need to go to the cross. You need to be beaten. You need to be nailed to that cross. And you need to die, son. And in the garden, Jesus is saying, okay, whoa, well, yeah, if, it's, if there's any other way, <laughs> let this cut pass. But not my will. Your will be done. That's humbleness. That's humbleness. Right? So Jesus had to choose to obey the eternal plan of God. And he had a choice. He did. He had a choice. He could have said, mm, nope, God. Have you seen these people? I've been around these people. They wanted to stone me. Are you kidding me? I'm not dying for these people. But no, instead of, he said, not my will, your will be done, Lord. He trusted the Lord. He believed <clears throat> the Lord. He had confidence in the Lord. Now, let's look at the word obedient in Philippians 2. A. Obedient is a compound word, and when it's put together, it means someone under someone else's authority. Listening to what that superior is speaking to him. Okay? Obedience takes this a step further. It always takes instructions a step further than just listening. A lot of people want to think that, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I serve people. I, I submit. I'm obedient. <laughs> right? Standing in front of somebody and looking at them and not <laughs> saying anything is Amen. not submission, Amen. is not obedience. Silent rebellion. That is silent <laughs> rebellion. When you're not saying anything and you're just looking and then you just go, okay. That is not obedience. That is not submission. That is rebellion and disobedience. Because you know full well you are not going to do what they are telling you to do. But you don't want to say anything. So you just... I know, I've seen the look. I've seen the look. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten the look. Just, I can say anything? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> no? All right? So what obedience is, is after listening and taking instructions to heart, this person then carries out the orders of his superior. Mm -hmm. Right? And they don't just carry it out with a bad attitude, but it's with an attitude of excellence. Right? It's an attitude of willingness, right? There's some joy there. It's with a smile on your face, okay? Right? So, from Philippians.
Philippians 2, 8, it tells us that obedient people are under authority. They submit under authority, right? They listen to what their superior is saying, and then they carry out the orders that have been given to them. This is true obedience. This is what Jesus did. Is this what we should do? Yes. 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 And I know your flesh is going, eh, eh. <laughs> No. It's <laughs> not what I want to do. Tell your flesh to shut up. Yeah. Okay? Shut up flesh. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I, I am a Christian. <laughs> that means that Jesus, God, is my superior. Amen. So I'm going to yes. do what he tells me to do. Yes. Right? Okay? So, as Jesus did, so are we to do. Right? But if we look at the world around us, right, we can see that rebellion is a huge problem in the world. Right? It's a huge problem. Yes. Yeah. It, it's almost getting worse. Yeah. I mean, just the disrespect from children and teenagers and young adults and adults. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I, I just kind of like, sometimes I'm just really surprised. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And it's because, well, I think it's like my generation, we've taken it too far. Because we thought our parents were wrong in their, dis in their um, discipline to us, thinking, well, I'm not going to treat my children like that. And we've taken it to the far extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody wins. Right. <laughs> Everybody should feel like they belong and that they can contribute and that they should participate. And then, like, no, that's not true. That's not true because what if your kid is not good in sports? Mm -hmm. Stop subjecting them to sports. <laughs> it's not their thing. Find out what they're good at. I used to have a friend in high school. And um, she would do different things, and you know she really wasn't that athletic. <laughs> but she, God bless her heart, she would try, and she would do different sports and different things. And she did field hockey, and then she's diving and all this stuff. But she just tried different things until she found something that she was really good at. And see, that's what we need to teach our children. If you know. Number one, if you really like this, you're going to have to work hard at it because not everything is just comes naturally to you. So if you really want to do this, you're going to have to work. Even if you are good at something, you still have to work. You still have to work. It doesn't mean just because you're a good baseball player or football player, that doesn't mean you're going to make it into the NFL. Just because you're the star quarterback of the high school team doesn't going to make, mean you're going to make it in college. And just because you're the star or whatever in college doesn't mean you're going to make it to the NFL. True. And just because you get into the NFL doesn't mean you're going to stay there. <laughs> no, there I mean, there's a lot. We see it. We see it on the news. There's a lot of guys. They go into the NFL. They think they're all that in a bag of chips mm -hmm. because they're riding on talent. Well, in the NFL, you can't ride on talent. You have to ride on talent and hard work. Yes. You look at the greats that have stayed there a long time, that have actually made a career out of it, they work hard off the field. During the off season, they are working hard. This isn't like, woo, football's over, give me a donut. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. They're like, no, give me that carrot stick. And they're working out, and they are working out with their buddies, and you know, if you look at the ones that have maintained a career, you can see their work ethic behind their talent. Yep. Okay? Talent will only take you so far. Right. You cannot depend and live on talent alone. You've got to work hard. Amen. All right? So let's read some other versions of Isaiah 19 and 20. The Amplified Classic version says this, If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. The message version says this. If, you're, if you'll willingly obey, you'll feast like kings. But if you're willful and stubborn, you'll die like dogs. That's right. God says so. <laughs> I love that version. <laughs> That's right. God says so. All right. That's the message version. That's right. 
The New Living Translation says this, if you will obey me, if you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the swords of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Young's literal translation says this, if you are willing and have hearkened, right? So obedience is listening right, and doing, the good of the land ye consume. And if ye refuse and have rebelled by the sword, ye are consumed, right? So again, to eat the good of the land, what do you need to do? Be willing, be willing and obedient. Be willing and obedient. Is it just be willing and obedient sometimes? No. All the time. Oh, yeah. all the time. All the time. <laughs> consistently. We've got to be consistently willing and obedient, right? That's right. Is there any confusion in Isaiah 119? No. 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 Okay, so it's very clear. I mean, this is as clear as you can get it, yeah. right? Yeah. If you will do this, then this is what's going to happen, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, um, I have I listened to many different messages, and I um, when Kenneth Hagen, does everybody know Kenneth Hagen? He yeah. is, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I want to say he's the founder of <laughs> Rhema Bible School yep. and um, church. Well, before all of that, he was a pastor and they had a parsonage and all of that. And he was very well taken care of, built up the church and all this. And the Lord told him, all right, now, now that you pastor the church, I want you to go on the road. I said, okay. So he went on the road. He had to leave the church, leave the parsonage, because okay, the parsonage is part of the church, right? Leave the comfort of a regular salary and go on the road. So he's going on the road. And he's going in the hole. And they don't have enough money to pay the bills. They don't have enough money for food. I think they're just scraping by. And he's losing money. He's not making money. He's not getting money. He's not being blessed. And, you know, he's, he's going around, and he's like, you know, I just, this didn't happen when we were in church. Like, you know, he's thinking back. If I hadn't, you know, gone out on the road, we would be in a better place. And so, you know, it started getting worse and worse and worse. And so he said, okay, you know, he, he couldn't understand this because he knew this scripture. He knew Isaiah 1, 19. He said, Lord. Your word says that if you're willing and obedient, I'll eat the good of the land. Well, I'm here. I'm doing what you're telling me to do. What's going on? But instead of just spouting off some scriptures, instead of just, you know, he seeks the Lord. And he starts fasting and praying and going, you know what? There is something wrong here. Lord, what's wrong? Show me what's wrong. And so for three days, he's fasting and he's praying. And this scripture comes up and he's like, Lord. You said in your word, if I'm willing and obedient, I will eat the good of the land. And the Lord said, you don't qualify. <laughs> what? He said, what do you mean I don't qualify? I did what you said. He said, you did what, you, you did what I said. Yes, but you're not willing. You're not willing. You're complaining. <laughs> you're murmuring. <laughs> you're talking about how good you had it. And you're not willing. You don't qualify. Goes, huh, okay. Well, <laughs> can we do something and not be willing? Yes. yes. Yeah, people do it all the time. Yeah, all the time. And we don't realize, can you do something that the Lord's told you to do and not be willing? Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we wonder, why aren't the blessings coming? I'm doing what God told me to do. But God is looking at the heart. Yeah. He isn't looking at your action. He's looking at the heart in your action. Mm -hmm. So are you willing? Are you submitting yourself? Are you like, yes, Lord, I want to do this because I trust you. I trust you, right? And so the reason why Kenneth Hagin's faith was not working was because he was unwilling. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. where, where, where does faith come from? From your heart. Yes. It's with the heart man believes. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so he had a heart problem. Mm -hmm. And if you have a heart problem, you're going to have a faith problem. Mm 
right? Romans 10, 10 says, with the heart man believes unto, and he does all of these things, right? right? And so the reason why he was having a problem was because he was not willing, right? Well, in his wisdom, <laughs> Kenneth said, can't tell me that you can't get willing real quick, <laughs> all right? Because once the Lord showed me that, I just made a hard adjustment, and I said, Lord, I'm willing. I am willing. You know my heart now. I get it. I got it. All right. I am willing. I am able, and I'm going to do this. Lord, you know my heart. Devil, you know my heart. And he said, immediately, things started to change. Immediately. Some of you guys are believing in the blessings. Could it be a heart problem? Could it be? Willingness, yep. or maybe obedience, mm -hmm. yeah. or both. <laughs> yeah, or both. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. And notice what he was doing. He was complaining about how good it was before. He was complaining how it was instead of really stepping in and asking the Lord and saying, "Lord, how should it be?" God said to call those things that be not as though they are. Not as though they, you know, don't call things as they are. <laughs> right? No, we call those things that be not as though they are. Right? Yep. Okay. A heart change precedes a life change. How many want your lives to change? Mm -hmm. In a greater way. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's always another level. There's always a greater level in anything that you do. You can say, oh, yeah, my, my life's good. Like, but you know what? Are you healing the sick? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Are you, yeah, sometimes it's not good enough. All the time. You know, your bill's paid all the time. You know? Do you have the extra to give out? Extra, and I'm not talking an extra hundred. I'm talking, let's talk about an extra, you know, thousand. Maybe extra ten. Maybe extra hundred thousand. Maybe an extra million laying around, you know? I mean, there's always a greater level. I mean, come on, let's not settle. We, this is why the Lord, he's always giving us instructions because he's got a path and he has things that he's prepared for us in advance. But if we're not going to be willing and obedient, we're not going to get on that path and we're not going to stay on that path. Right? Okay. All right. So again, obedience is not about justification. Because you can think, well, isn't this like about works? No. No, no, no. This is not about justification. All right? This is about getting on the path, the right path that God has ordained for you and nobody else but you. All right? Um, let's go to Psalms 8411. Because a lot of times when things aren't coming to pass, we think God's withholding. God's withholding. God does not withhold. Okay. Psalms 8411. Same when you get there. Amen. And it says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. See, when you're walking uprightly before the Lord, you are walking in willingness and obedience. Right? And so when you're doing that, he is not going to withhold any good thing to you. Right? The New Living Translation says this. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Look at that. So if you do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, then what's going to happen? No good thing will be withheld. No good thing will be withheld. Good things will start pouring down on you. Yes. Right? And what, what is right? What, what are the right things to do? Walk willing and obedient. What God tells you. Right? Just whatever he tells you. That's right. Right? Let me read you this. 
Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. But many there be which go in thereat. All right? So there's a narrow path that God wants us to be on. Now, there are other paths. So there's a wide path, but that path will lead to destruction. Usually that's the easy way. Yes. Usually that's the, well, hmm, I've got two choices here. And you know, your flesh always wants to go the easy way. Now, we don't want to work that hard, right? We'll work hard enough to kind of get by sometimes, survive, you know. Some people have a little bit more extra initiative and umption, you know. <laughs> and so it's like, all right, kind of some pick up and go. But usually the flesh is lazy, doesn't want to do much, you know? And so it's like, okay, but if we are gonna walk on the narrow path, that means we have to do what God is telling us to do. And in order to do what he's telling us to do, we need to trust him, right? Because that's what it all boils down to. Trusting the Lord in what he tells you to do so that you can do what he's told you to do. Right? See, when we willingly obey him, we will eat the good of the land. And this is a process. This is a process that, you know, we come into, we keep stepping into in a greater amount. Right? We can see brief moments of good of the land. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. I don't care who you are. Come up to me and you tell them, well, Pastor, what's good for me? You have a home, right? Mm -hmm. You got food to eat every day? Do you have a car to take you to work? Because I can tell you there's some people that don't have that. You know, Eric is saying, you know, in Mexico. You know? It's like, and they don't get the same wages that we get, and the prices are still the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? But there's money in Mexico. There's blessings in Mexico. You know, they have an entrepreneur spirit there. Mm -hmm. But there's also like spirit of you know rebellion and disobedience and laziness too. Yeah. So it's kind of like just this getting by kind of a thing. But they just need the word of God. They just need the word of God. And also, we've you know, been taken advantage of. Mm. All their resources kind of stripped from their country and their land. But I believe the Lord's restoring all of that. Oh, yes. yes. You know, so they're, they're going to start seeing their land resources coming back. Oh, yeah. And now they have more wisdom. They're going to be able to use it in a greater way. Mm -hmm. you know, God is good. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 1. And it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now that word obey is the same Greek word that was in Ephesians 2.8. Right? So it's children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Right? And like I said earlier, we're not teaching obedience to our children. We're not teaching that. We're not teaching discipline. A lot of you, when you came, first came to the church, it was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, we had to, teach, had to teach the parents how to discipline, how to teach their children to obey. Because it's, be, it's not fun being in a household where your children don't obey, is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone say, well, they still don't listen to me? Mm. <laughs> You're still rebellious and disobedient? Well, what are you sowing? What are you sowing? Because we're, we're children of God. So who are we obeying? Are we obeying our Heavenly Father? Right? If we keep reading, it says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Uh -huh. So you see this. And it doesn't matter what they said, you know, what your parents said, what they have done, you still have to honor and respect them. Cut the attitude. 
It, I am 39 years old, and I still cannot give attitude to my mother. She calls me out on it every single time. Good for her. Amen. You know, like, because that is not what she deserves. She yeah. deserves respect and honor. Mm -hmm. Every adult deserves respect right. and honor. Yes. You know? But you have to use wisdom with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't just jump in a car some stranger, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just because my, your mama said, no, you better check with your mama <laughs> first. <laughs> Amen? All right? But this word obey is a word that people don't like. Yeah. You say obey and people just like, <laughs> automatically it's like, what? <laughs> oh, nobody tells me what to do. <laughs> no. Who are you? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when we hear that, our flesh recoils. And it's like, mm, I don't know, I don't know you. No. But we transfer that over to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now we think, oh, I, I, I'll obey the Lord. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Think back to the last commandment that the Lord gave to you. Are you still doing it? Did he tell you to stop? <laughs> Ouch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Yes. Let me say that again. Partial obedience is still disobedience. So it's not going to work for you. You're not staying on the path. You're being led astray. Because you think you know, but I got it. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Um, who's the author and finisher of your faith? Jesus. Who's the author and finisher of your Jesus. faith? Jesus. Oh, oh, not you? No. no. Jesus. Jesus is. Jesus. Right? And Jesus said, I only do those things I see my father do, and I only say those things I hear my father say. And he was our example. Are we doing that? Mm -hmm. No. Are we doing that fully? I mean, come on, this, now it's time to like really get real, all right? Really get real and honest with yourself and go, you know what, am I being really willing and obedient in every area of my life, in everything that the Lord has told me to do? Everything, right? Any of it? Any of it. In Ephesians 2, we're in Ephesians, let's go over to chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. It says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So before you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and even those that have accepted him and have not, you know, kind of walked away, all right, they're following after the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan. Satan. Mm -hmm. That's Satan. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan is referred to as the God of this world, all right? And look at that. There's a spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. There's a spirit of disobedience. There's a spirit of rebellion that is on this earth waiting for people to yield to it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the devil is the chief rebellion, isn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he rebelled against God. And he rebelled against God, and he convinced a third of the angels. Think of that. He convinced a third of the angels to go with him. Right. Saying, we, you know what? We deserve better. Mm -hmm. We deserve more. Mm -hmm. Who is this God? He wanted to be not just equal with God. He wanted to be above God. He wanted to be God, and that was not his call. And this is why he rebelled against God, and he was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels. And he and you know what? He cannot get to God. So who does he try to go to? He goes through you to try to get to God. So if he can get you to rebel and be disobedient, he is like, yes. Because that hurts God. That hurts him. Right? However, 
Now that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a choice on whether to sin or not. Mm -hmm. What, Pastor? I have a choice? Yeah, you have a choice now. Before, you didn't have a choice. You had your old man nature. It's a sin nature. But now, when Jesus made his home in you, all right, the old man went away. Behold, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have a righteousness nature living on the inside of you. So you have a choice whether to sin or not. Amen. Right? What happens is we haven't renewed our mind. And so it's easy to step into some, some sins because our mind hasn't been renewed. Thinking, oh wait, I don't need to do this anymore. What? Now we have a choice. And a lot of people say, well, no, you don't have a choice. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. If I told you, I want you to go home today and I want you to think about bananas all day long. You gonna think about bananas? No. <laughs> Why not? I'm your pastor. And I'm telling you to think about bananas all day. You're not gonna think about bananas. You're gonna be like, okay, pastor has lost it. I don't know why she wants us thinking about bananas. Bananas has nothing to do with Jesus. <laughs> Look, you're not gonna think. You're, you're not gonna be thinking about bananas all day. It might come up since I talked about it, but you're gonna be like, oh, my, actually, a banana sounds good right now. <laughs> but once you have that banana, boom, poof. Then why are you thinking about what the devil's bringing to you? Exactly. Instead of rebelling against God, why don't you rebel against the devil? That's right. I'm not gonna think about that devil. That is not what my Father in heaven says about me or what I have. Mm -hmm. No, when we keep hearing and listening to the devil, we are yielding to rebellion and disobedience against God. Because God didn't tell you to think on those things. What did he tell you to think on? Things that are pure, things that are holy, things that are of a good report. Mm -hmm. So by you thinking about all these other things, you are rebelling and you are being disobedient towards your God, your Father in heaven. Yep. Wow, that's pretty hard. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. The Bible said it. Now, Jesus obeyed because he did what? He trusted the Lord. People rebel because they don't trust. Let's go over to Deuteronomy 9. You know what? Let's look at some Bible examples. I'm going to start at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 22 and 23. And it says, And at Tabarah, and at Messiah, and at Kibroth, Hatam, Hatala, sorry, excuse me, the pronunciation, ye provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. Now, this is in reference to the children of Israel when they were coming out of the desert and going into the promised land, right? That's Numbers 13 and 14 chapters, okay? And so the children of Israel had a choice. They had a choice whether to trust God and go into the promised land, right? Because it was a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, God said, send out the spies, one from each tribe. There's 12 of them. They all went out. They were called to spy out the land, to take inventory, all right? They were not called or asked to make an opinion on whether they could do it or not. Read the account, all right? The Lord gave specific instructions. And see, this is what we, all, we always add to it. Stop adding. Stop adding, okay? The Lord told them, I want you to send out 12 spies. And I want you to find, take inventory, and figure out where is everybody at? What are the people? What do they have? Is it a land flowing with milk and honey? Is it everything that God said it would be? And so they went, and they spied out the whole land. They were gone for like 40 days, like that. Taking inventory, right? And when they came back, 
They said, yes, it is a land flowing with milk and honey. And we went here, we saw these people, we went there, we saw these people. He's like, but they are giants. And we are mere grasshoppers in their sight. Who told them that? First of all, do you realize that you just crossed the desert and God took care of the greatest army in the world, the Egyptian army, and they did not even have to pull a sword out? Hello. And see, yet, they come back and they've already made an opinion saying, oh, well, it's everything that God said it would be, but how, how are we going to do this? Who told them that they would have to do it? Who told them that? Because God didn't tell them that. God said, send out the spies, figure, find out what's there. And see, they didn't trust the Lord that God would give them the plan to get the victory. God's the one that sent them there. And see, we think, you know, God is sending us places and we go, uh, how are you going to do that, Lord? What are you going to do? How are you going to take care of this? And see, they didn't trust God enough that he would be with them. They didn't believe that God was big enough. Even after everything that they saw, they chose to think that they were grasshoppers. So why did they rebel? Why did the children of Israel rebel against the Lord? Because they didn't believe. Keep it really simple. They didn't believe. They didn't trust. They didn't trust that the Lord would help them and continue to help them. They thought they would have to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. See, why did Jesus submit his will to the Father and let the people take him, whip him, nail him to the cross? Why did he let that happen? Because he trusted the Lord. These aren't, it's, I'm not trying to trick you, okay? It's very simple. I'm just trying to get this in you because we are trying to justify our disobedience. We are trying to justify our rebellion. Because the children of Israel did that. They were justifying their rebellion against God. Well, they're giants. And look at us. What do we have? And yet, you have Moses, who was the most decorated and probably most experienced general from the Egyptian army. Hello? Come on. You know how to fight? So, you know, that wasn't a mistake <laughs> that he was, you know, going to, you know, that's why he was in the palace to get that experience. No? Yeah. And so was Joshua, so was Caleb. It's like, yeah, they were slaves, but they had skills. Mm -hmm. Can you say that again? Yeah, they were slaves, but they were, had uh -huh. skills. Mm hmm and so when they left Egypt, they left that slave mentality behind. Yeah. And as they crossed over, they are supposed to be stepping into the fullness of God. But then they started looking in the natural. Hmm. And you see, they struggled. They struggled. I mean, God got so frustrated with him. He was like, I I'm done. He's like, I'm leaving. And Moses had to be like, wait, Lord. <laughs> wait, Lord. Now, you know, everybody knows that you've chosen these people and you have brought them out. If you leave them, what is that going to say about you? <laughs> I mean, Moses had to like really <laughs> kind of like, come on, Lord, come back. Don't give up on us, you know. <laughs> Thank God for Moses. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because even God said, these are a bunch of stiff neck, <laughs> rebellious, disobedient people. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They're an example to us. Yeah. Because what areas in your life are you stiff necked, stubborn, rebellious, and disobedient? Mm -hmm. And don't try to lie and say, but, no. Mm -hmm. Either God said it and you did it, or you didn't do it at all. Mm -hmm. Well, but I did it for two weeks. You didn't do it at all. Stop, stop trying to justify that behavior. Mm -hmm. 
Just because you confess a scripture for two weeks, and when God said to confess that scripture until he comes home, <laughs> right? Pretty much. What are you doing not doing that? Mm -hmm. Are you God now? You know better than God now? Mm -hmm. It's real quiet in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no? Jesus was obedient unto death because he completely and utterly trusted the Lord. Mm -hmm. And don't you dare say, well, that was Jesus. Mm -hmm. No, Jesus is living on the inside of you. And if you yield to him, you will be able to completely and utterly trust the Lord. Mm -hmm. Stop trying to justify your behavior. Disobedience is disobedience. Rebellion is rebellion. You cannot justify it away. You can't. I don't care how you try to twist it, turn it, whatever. Put glitter on it. Rebellion is rebellion. Disobedience is disobedience. And what is that? It's very simple. Not doing what the Lord told you to do. Very simple. If you're not doing that, you're in rebellion and disobedience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hallelujah. Now it's interesting. I want to look at some scriptures. Um, because if you look in the New Testament, let's go back to the New Testament. If you look at the New Testament... You can see that the word for disobedient, disobedience is often interchanged with disbelief. Mm -hmm. Right? So let's go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I just want to look at three scriptures, but there's so much more. And I just, you know, highly recommend you do your own study on it. And I'm going to read the King James, and then I'm going to read another version of it. And you're going to see that interchangeable of disobedience and disbelief, okay? Uh, John 3, 36. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now the New Living Translation says this, And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life, Anyone who doesn't obey, look at that, the son will never experience eternal life but remains under God's angry judgment. So they replaced, not, doesn't, doesn't believe, right? And he that believeth not, they change that who doesn't obey. Isn't that interesting? Yep. Romans 11.30. Because we have to remember that the New Testament was written in the Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, right? So the Greek has a lot more meaning, you know, in, in one word than just one of our English words. Yes. Okay? All right. Verse, Romans 11, verse 30. says, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. The, new, the NIV, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. Okay. So we see here again, belief, disbelief, replaced with disobedient. Mm -hmm. right? If we don't believe, we don't obey. Right. If we don't trust, we won't obey. Because if you're wondering, why aren't I doing what God is telling me to do? Why is this so difficult? You don't trust. Mm -hmm. You don't believe. You don't believe it's going to work out how you, you know, he told you it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. We've got to change that. Mm -hmm. We've got to come up higher. Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. Hebrews 4 verse 6 says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that we must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter in not. Wait a minute. Am I right? Verse 6. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, all right. Let me start that again. Seeing therefore it remaineth that 
Some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Now, the, this scripture is talking about the children of Israel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, that's the King James Version. This is the NIV. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter the rest, that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Right? If you go up to verse 2, it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Who's them? The children of Israel. All right? But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. All right? So they got the word of the Lord, but what happened was they didn't mix it with faith. They didn't mix it with trust. They didn't mix it with being fully assured that God is with them. And he said, this is our land. I mean, this, all the spies had to do was like, this is our land. It's flowing with milk and honey. We've got people here, here, and here. They are huge. They've got this, this, and this. I want to see God do this. <laughs> what is God going to do? Go ahead, Moses. God better be with you. <laughs> but they didn't. They already made their decision. How can God do this? What are we going to do? It wasn't their problem. It wasn't their problem. And see, some of you are have gotten commandments from the Lord, and you're going, how are we going to do this? <laughs> how can I do this? I can't do this. And you start listening to the devil. And then you rebel and you disobey because I couldn't see it. Uh -huh. Because you're not seeing in the right way way yes you're seeing in the natural and you're not seeing in the spirit and second corinthians 5 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight that's where we need to see things right in first peter 2 6 and 8 you can go there if you want it talks about belief and those being disobedient so 1 Peter 2, 6 and 8 says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I say in Sion, a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which, is, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Right? A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which are stumbled at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So you see here in this scripture, instead of saying those that believed and those that believed not, he's talking about those that believe and those that are disobedient. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Uh -huh. So disobedient, when we are disobedient, it's because we don't believe. When we are disobedient, when we rebel, it's because we don't trust. Right? Hallelujah. Refusing to believe is not innocent ignorance. we got to get this. It's not innocent ignorance. It is rebellion and disobedience. When the Lord says, trust me, do this, what are we supposed to do? Trust, trust him and do it. Trust him and do it. And see, one of the reasons why you don't trust him is because you have not entered into relationship. You've not entered into relationship. You've entered into religion. I go to church. I read my Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's great. Yay. But that's not relationship. <laughs> well, some people want like a, a clap and congratulations. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Do you know the Lord? No, no, do, do you really know him? I mean, I, you know, during intercessory prayer, it was so glorious and so wonderful, and I'm just sitting in the presence of God, and I am just, I'm laughing because he is just so silly sometimes, and like every time I kept saying, good, good father, he's just like, <laughs> I'm like, you're so silly, Lord, it's coming. 
<laughs> you know, and I'm just like, I mean, it was just this back and forth, and he's like, you really think so? And I was like, Lord, you know it. And then I'm saying, I'm, he's like, I know I'm loved, and he's like, do you know that, Melissa? And I'm like, yeah, I know that, Lord. And we're just, this is a beautiful exchange. And it's like, wow, that's relationship. It's not just singing a song. To air, thinking about what you're going to eat for lunch today. Amen. Mm-hmm. But you have to set yourself. I had to set myself and go, I am go- this is for you, Lord. Mm-hmm. I'm going to set myself down here mm-hmm. and I'm going to, I'm in the throne room. Mm-hmm. I am before you because that's where I belong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he just came down. Mm-hmm. And it was just this back and forth. And I'm, I'm just like laughing. Because just how he was. I mean, you know, we think that God is just, you know, like a king on the throne. Just so serious. Mm-hmm. He is the most fun ever. Yes. <laughs> ever. I mean, you should you should have seen him. He's like, he's got a silly grin on his face. He's like, <laughs> he's just running around. I'm just like, you know, and it's just like, how can I bring this down to earth? It's just like, you know, when you see a loving daughter who's like five or six with their, with their father, you know, and they just get so close and just, you know, we were rubbing noses, you know, it's just like, Lord. I mean, it was just so beautiful. I mean, I think of it now and it just brings tears, you know, but that wouldn't have happened if I didn't step into it. Right. Come on. Okay. You can't just sit there and go, okay, zap me, Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm waiting. Amen. No, come on. It is not going to work that way. It's not going to work that way. You, you kind of have to envision yourself in there. And then God just takes over. And it's like, yes, that's relationship. That's what God wants us to step into, right? But see, when God tells us to do something, trust me, do this. We've got to do it. And we can't say, well, I I can't. Yes, you can. You're letting fear tell you you can't. It doesn't have to be perfect the the first time. You might stumble. You might fall. You might make a lot of mistakes. But you know what? You just go, okay, Lord, I I don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) And he's going to be like, it's all right, baby. Just do the best you can do. Help is coming. And see, when you're faithful with a little, you'll be what? Faithful Faithful with much. much. God wants to see what you do with a little. Are you just going to be, I can't do it. You know, you see a little three-year-old or four-year-old or five or six or seven or eight, you know. (laughs) And they, uh, you know, they try to do something. And then they just get so fresh and they go, forget it. You know, or they just start crying. You know, having a fit because they can't do it. And it's like once you come along and you just go, okay, hold on, hold on, no, no. Take a deep breath. Calm down. It's okay. Let me help you. And see, once you start helping them, then they go, oh, okay. And they get it. And it's like a peace that comes. And see, that's what God wants to do with you. Stop having your little spiritual temper tantrum. (laughs) Not my way. He's not doing what I told him to do. (laughs) God's not saying, I didn't tell him to do that. (laughs) You know? No, God's going to come down. He's going to go, come here, come here. It's okay. Take a deep breath. Come here. Let me help you. Let me show you this. Or he's going to bring people in your path. But see, this is why you have to be obedient, willing and obedient, because if you're not on the right path, you're not going to meet the right people. God won't be able to. He's already prepared that. But see, if you quit, you're not going to meet that person he has down at the path there because you have to keep going. And see, a lot of times we quit too soon. We quit too soon. We get on the, off the path. And see, what happens is we get off the path, and then we go the long way around. And it's like, oh, okay, we start back here. And then we have to like start up, uh, start, start up again. Yeah. Right? But see, if we stay consistent, you're going to start seeing it over and over and over again, the blessings, the preparation that God has for you. And there are some things where you go, that's God. Mm-hmm. That, that is God. <laughs> you know, there is no, I mean, when that gentleman was in that parking lot just waiting, that is the Lord. 
It wasn't a coincidence. Mom being like, oh, that's just coincidence, you know. I was like, no. It could have been a day where, you know, he didn't have to pick his partner up. Could have been it. His partner could have driven into work himself, and there would have been nobody there because he was the only person in that parking lot. That was the Lord. Yeah. That's right. He knew. He's like, she only takes these corners too, too <laughs> close. <laughs> so he knows. He knows. Now let's go over to 1 Samuel. So I want you to see how this affects your whole life. 1 Samuel. We're going to look at King Saul. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, 1 Samuel 8, all right, before this, chapter 7 and 8, you know, uh, the children of Israel are asking for a king. Right? Mm -hmm. They're doing this because they see Samuel and they see his sons. And they're like, your sons are not walking in your ways. We want a king, right? Right? They're looking in the natural, not trusting God will provide a prophet that will walk in the ways that Samuel walked. You know, this is the importance of being a father, right? So they're looking in the natural, and they're like, well, we just want to be like everybody else. Everybody else has a king, so we want to be like all of them. We want a king, right? And so um, in verse 7, Look at what the Lord says. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Ooh. Right. You know, there are going to be times, if you are insistent enough, God will let you have your way. If you're insistent enough, he, he'll let you have your way. But you're going to have to reap all the consequences that come with that. Now, if God says, because God told them, Samuel told them, you don't want a king. You don't want a king. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your, your sons and your daughters. He's gonna, you're going to have to work for him. He told them all the things that are going to happen. We still want a king. I mean, it's like, really? It's like almost like a spirit of stupid <laughs> came upon them, you know? Because it's like, after that list of things, I would have been like, uh, no, thank you. I kind of like my land. I kind of like where my life right now. So, you know what? I'll choose your way. Because if God says something, says, no, you don't want that, what are we supposed to do? What should we do? Okay. <laughs> okay, I don't want that. I don't care how shiny and bright and good it looks. If God says, you don't want that, you need to say, okay. <laughs> God says, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that runny apple. <laughs> it's like, you don't want it. All right? But God said, you know what? They kept insisting on it, so God said, give it to them. And God helped them. He chose the king. All right? So he chose Saul. All right? Okay. So, then Samuel anointed Saul. He was king. Now, let's go over to verse 13. I mean, chapter 13, I'm sorry. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Now, there were a series of battles that Israel was going into, okay? And so, the Lord was helping them with the battles, right? So, Saul is king, Samuel is the prophet, he's the priest, okay? And so Samuel gave Saul instructions, do not move, don't do anything until you see me, right? I gotta, there's some things that I need to do, right, to prepare the battle and all of this stuff that before you go into the battle. We have to give sacrifice to the Lord, all of this stuff, okay? All right, verse 8. And he tarried seven days, according to the time set that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Should he be doing that? No. He is no. not priest. Uh -uh. He should not be doing that. But what? notice in verse 7, he saw the people scattering. He wasn't trusting 
He wasn't trusting that even though the people are scattering, we'll have enough for the battle. Right? A lot of times God waits a little longer to see, are you going to fully trust him? Are you going to get all that doubt and unbelief out of you? No. I mean, there are times where the Lord told, when um, there was one battle that the Lord told David to, to go into, he had, he's, I think he started out with like 10,000 men, <laughs> whittled down to 300. <laughs> okay, you know, and it was just one thing after another. And the Lord said, um, those that are all tired, they can stay here. All right, if you're all tired, you can't go, stay here. Come on, let's go. And then they got to the river and they said, uh, keep all the ones that lap, that are drinking that water like a dog. Okay, <laughs> you know, send the rest home. I mean, so, you know, you've got to trust that the Lord has provision for you. Saul did not. He decided to take it into his own hands. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 10. And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of offering and burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. Is that a coincidence? No. No, <laughs> no it's not. That is not a coincidence at all. All right. And Saul went out to greet him that he might salute him. <laughs> so Saul, thinking he didn't do, do anything wrong, hey, are you Samuel? Nope, nope. <laughs> you know? And Samuel said, what has thou done? No, hello. No, good to see you, king. No, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou comest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me into Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced, <laughs> I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. <laughs> Justification. Do you see that? <laughs> Justification. Because I saw the people scatter. I forced myself. You forced yourself, Saul? Really? So what does Samuel say? And Samuel said to Saul, Thou has done foolishly. Thou has not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. Look at that. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And let me tell you something. Who is a man after God's own heart? David. David. The Bible does say David. But in Acts 13, 22, it says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Who is a man after God's own heart? The one who does what God wants to do. That's right. Someone who will do everything that God has told them to do. Now, David was a man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? No. No. But when <clears throat> David was called out, he did not justify. That's right. He always owned up to him. He was like, you are right. I am wrong. I, I repent. But you do not see this in Saul. What did Saul do? He justified his behavior. He didn't say, you're right. You're right. I, I should not have made that sacrifice. No, he justified it. He said, well, you weren't here. And then he puts the blame on Samuel. Well, you weren't here in the allotted time. So... You still do not have the right to make that offering. Yep. Uh -huh. Now, let's go to chapter 13, because it wasn't immediate, right? That he just was not king anymore, uh -huh. okay? All right. Now, Sam, 1 Samuel 15. Now, go, I'm, I'm reading in verse 3. I'm going to kind of skip around, all right? But maybe in your own time, read the whole chapter, all right? So 1 Samuel 15, 3. Right? Um, it says, Now go and smite the Amalite, Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. 
but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Okay, so what are the instructions? Kill everything. Kill everything. Kill everything. All right? Now you might think, well, God, that's kind of mean. No, no, you, you don't know these people, okay? Uh -huh. These were the people that sacrificed their own babies, uh -huh. all right, to um, pagan gods. and I mean, these were, whew, okay? And so, um, um, so God was giving specific instruction, all right? Now, we're going to skip down to verse 7. And Saul smote the Amalek, Am Amalekites. From Havilah unto thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agai, is it Agai? Agai. Agai, thank you, Agai, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agai and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, that all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Was that the instructions? No. 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 What were they supposed to do? Everything. Oh, kill everything. So it was Saul and the people. Notice, read this, it was Saul and the people. Okay, this is important. Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Wow. I mean, because God saw all this, and he said, You know what? I've changed my mind about Saul being king. That's what repent means, to change your mind. This is what the Lord is saying. I've changed my mind. And he said, For he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Saul, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Samuel was trying to, to intercede for Saul, but it was too late. It was too late. Verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. No. <laughs> what? No, look at this. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this, the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? You know, it's like, don't lie to me. Come on, man. You know, verse 15, you can't hide from God. It doesn't matter what you try to do behind closed doors, you cannot hide from God. Whatever you do in darkness will be revealed in light. Amen. And don't be deceived because you got away with it one time. Or two times a day. That's God's grace. He's giving you time to change. But there will be a day where grace will go and he will start revealing it. Mm -hmm. And he'll start calling you out. Mm -hmm. And you cannot lie. Lie you fry. All right, verse 15. <laughs> and Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Oh, okay, so now, now he's lying. Because now he's like, well, we're going to use those to sacrifice them to God. Did God need, want that sacrifice? No, he said, you need to kill all of them. All right? Look at how he's justifying. Verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thy own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? So now he's bringing it back to the past. <laughs> like, um, wasn't God with you? You know, you didn't even want to be king. They had to find him in the stuff. He was hiding in the stuff because <laughs> he didn't want to be anointed king. All right? And the Lord set thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and brought Agag, the king of Amalekite, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. 
wait a minute. Mm -hmm. What was verse verse nine? But Saul and the people. See, now he's trying to put blame on the people. It's like, excuse me, Saul, you are king. You're not some other, you know, lowly person. You are king, and your orders were to destroy everything. And yet, you chose to follow the people and not the Lord. And then he's still justifying. He's still not taking responsibility. He's still not saying, uh, I, I repent. No, he's saying, no, I have, I, and he didn't, because the king is still alive. Hello? Mm -hmm. I said to destroy everyone. Why is the king still alive? Come on, come on, Saul. But how many times have we gone into a situation where we think, I'm obeying the Lord. I've obeyed everything that he said. And it's like, mm hmm. Yeah. Everything? Why is the king still alive? Come on now. Verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Wow. He totally got off his path and now there is no way to get back on it. And you might think this is harsh, but we just read in verse, what, what chapters was it? Eight. Eight and, thir and then verse 13. We read in verse 13. He already made this mistake before, and he didn't learn his lesson. He never even repent. And then in verse 26, when finally he's getting the sentence, I think finally Saul realizes, whoa, wait, what? Um, wait, 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 wait. And Samuel said unto Saul, unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And I think in verse 25, Saul does say this. Well, now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and take again with me that I may worship the Lord. That wasn't a meaningful repentance. No. That isn't, uh, I apologize for disobeying the Lord. That is just, well, just pray for me. Just pardon my sin and come back with me so I can obey. It's like... You're not getting it, Saul. You are not following the Lord. You are trying to justify your behavior. You're blaming it on the people when you are king. The responsibility stops with you. It's not the people's fault. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to blame the people. See, when God gives you an order, when he gives you a command... Stop. You can't blame other people for your disobedience. You can't blame your husband. You can't blame your wife. You can't blame your kids. Because you know what? When you go home to be with the Lord, it's going to be you and the Lord. And you can't say, well, but my husband. Or, but my wife. My wife didn't want to go with me. My wife didn't want to go to church with me. And... My kids didn't want to go to church, and you're the parent. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what your kids want. Right. Sometimes you have to make decisions for them <laughs> because That's they right. don't know what's, what's right. That's right. You know? Hallelujah. Yeah. We've got to stop trying to justify our behavior. God wants obedience. And see, when we miss it, we just need, just admit. I, yes, you're right, I missed it. Don't try to justify it. Don't just, oh, well, see what happened was. <laughs> uh, well, um, um. No, 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 no. Don't try to lie your way out of it. Because God, you see, God was the one that told Samuel. Samuel wasn't with them. And as soon as Saul did that, he's told Samuel, I, I changed my mind about Saul being king. 
He is not following me. He is not following my commandments. And that is one thing that Saul had prophesied to the people. They said, I will give you a king, but you need to obey the commandment of the Lord, and he will still be with you. That is God's grace and mercy. Because it wasn't God's perfect will for them to have a king. But he let them have a king, but he with stipulations. I'll let you have a king. This is all that's going to happen. But I will prosper you as a nation if you still follow me. And Saul did not choose to follow him. Because the people are doing what the king said. Mm-hmm. Yep. They're doing what he said. And so the buck stops there. Buck stops with you. But the reason why he disobeyed is because he didn't trust. He didn't trust the Lord and what he said. He didn't believe the Lord. I'm sure the people are looking at it going, well, all of these are really good. We can use these. I mean, why would we just destroy all of this? Got to trust the Lord. It's not for you to understand. You can obey the Lord and not understand why you're doing what you're doing. Just trust. Just take that step of faith. I do it a lot. The Lord says, do this. And I go, I don't even know how it's going to work. Okay, that doesn't even look like it's going to work. But you know what, Lord? You know a lot more than me. And I do it, and it works out. And it's like, well, thank you, Jesus. I obeyed him. But you know what? There's more areas that we need to yield ourselves to in obedience to God. Now let's look at, I want to leave with this Bible example. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at Abraham. In Genesis 22, I'm going to read Kind of quickly, verses 1 through 14. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Morah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee of. What? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Wait a minute. <laughs> Lord, am I hearing you right? You want me you want me to take my son, my, my only son, the one that you gave me, the one that you promised me, the one that you prophesied that took like a really long time to get here. <laughs> All right. You want me to go and take him and like sacrifice him like a burnt offering, like 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 a lamb. <laughs> like, yeah. Did Abraham do any of that? Now, if you go, verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went in unto the place of which God hath told him. No questioning. I mean, he just said, okay, went to sleep, got up early, let's go. Wow. Trust. He's trusting. Verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now we're seeing his faith. Because what did he tell the young men? Stay here. The lad and I are going to go, and we're going to be back. We are going to be back. Look, he's speaking faith. Because, see, he has trust in God. He said, well, you know what? God gave me the son. So it's his son. So I'm going to give it. But you know what? In order to fulfill the promise and the prophecy that God told me, I need him. So we're going to come back. (laughs) So whatever God's going to do, he's going to do it. Either he's going to provide a sacrifice or he's going to raise him from the dead. I don't care. We're coming back. We're coming back. You see his faith and trust in God. Right? Verse 7. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they both went, they 
they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in, in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now we talk a lot about Abraham's obedience, but I want you to look at his son Isaac. He had faith and trust and obedience to his father. Because, I mean, think about it. Your dad taking you up to a mountain. You burnt, he's building the altar, and you know, you, he's done this before, but there's always been a lamb, there's always been an ox, there's always been some animal, and there's nothing in sight, and you're like, God, dad, dad said there, God was going to provide an offering. Um, and then he goes, come here, son. <laughs> Okay, and he starts bounding <laughs> your hands, and is like, um, Dad, <laughs> what's going on here? If it were me, I'd have been like, no, <laughs> bye. <laughs> ah, he's screaming down the mountain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the obedience of Abraham and see Isaac fell right in line obedience to his father trusting that God will provide God will provide now my dad will sacrifice me and my life is in his hands that's what Isaac did and there was no there's no record of a struggle there's no record of Abraham saying right son before we go up to the mountain. This might alarm you, but God said to kill you. And um, so don't be alarmed though, right? You know, it's, it, it's none of that. It was just almost like a blind faith. Because, it, it, you know, Isaac was kind of connecting the dots and he's like, okay, we got the wood, we got the fire, we got, um, we're missing something. And Abraham, all he said was, God will provide. God will provide. Now let's keep reading. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from him. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And verse 14, and Abraham called that name of that place Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Yes. My provider, Jehovah Jireh my provider his grace is sufficient for me Amen. you see why are we being stuck here in fear and doubt and unbelief when god is providing yes. as long as we step out and we get into faith and we know god's word is true and every other thing is a liar and so as long as i step out and i trust god with all of my heart and i might not do it perfect but he has got my back he has got me. He is providing for me. And I trust him. And it will be as he said it will be. Amen. Yes. That's right. He is, his, he is our provider. Yes. yes. But we've got to obey. We've got to be willing and obedient. And then we'll do what? We will eat the good of the land. We will eat the good of the land. Amen. Why are you hustling? Right. Why are you trying to make it? Why are you trying to, you know, try to make things happen? Just follow the Lord. Just follow the Lord. Yeah, but I haven't seen anything. You're lying. Come on. You are lying. Yeah. You have saying that I don't see the blessings of the Lord. You're a liar. I'm calling it out right now. You are a liar. You tell me. I will. There have been phones that have been given. People that stayed in their houses. God's paid bills. Now, it might not be exactly where we want it today, but you got to keep going. Yes. You got to keep walking on that path. Yes. You got to keep obeying. You got to yes. keep being willing to obey. Don't just stay there and go, well, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Tell that spirit of stupid to get off of you. Tell that pity party to get off of you. And you stand yes. on that mountain called Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And you stand until you see it happen. Glory, 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 Woo. glory, glory. Huh. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Amen.
this is why we're going to camp on this for a little bit. See, now we've got righteousness. We, Lord had us preach on righteousness, knowing who we are in Christ, knowing that we belong in his presence. Right? Because it's not based on our works. It's based on the finished works of Jesus Christ. Amen. But then it's like, okay, so then where is works? Where does obedience come in? And this is where obedience comes in. Obedience puts you on the path that God has for you so that you can get the blessings that he's already prepared for you. He's already prepared them for you. You get that? He's already prepared them for you. So it's just like Pac-Man. It's just like Pac-Man. Just go. Avoid the ghosts. Avoid, Avoid those devils. And just keep following the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And you're going to get to the fruit. You're going to get to it. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Mm. God is good. Yeah. And he is worthy to be praised. Yes. But we've got to step into that. You've got to step into righteousness. You've got to step into grace. You've got to step into what God has told you. And see, if it has not come, there's many prophecies that the Lord has spoken over every single person here. Amen. If they have not come to pass, it's our fault. they're not done. Amen. It's not done. Grab a hold of it. Come on. Don't let go. Amen. Don't let go. They will come to pass. But you've got to believe it and you've got to trust God. That what you are doing is exactly what God is telling you to do. Don't just start walking around in the dark going, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know. No. Get on your knees, fast, pray, seek the Lord, and find out what's the problem. Because my life should match the word of God. Amen. Stop watering down the word to fit your life because you feel it doesn't work. No, it works when you work the word. The word works when you work the word. You got to work it in your life. You got to work it. Come on, you got to work it. Just fumble around going, oh, I don't know. I guess God just doesn't want to bless me. That's a lie. That is a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And you know what? God can't make you submit. God can't do it for you. I can't do it for you. You've got to do it. That's right. I can take you to the river of living water, but it's up to you on whether to drink or not. That's right. Woo! So don't complain if you're thirsty because you didn't drink. Come on. Amen. Come on. That's right. Glory, 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 glory. We serve a great God. Amen. You can't tell me you don't serve a great God. I'll testify for we serve a great God because this church should not even be here. Amen. Amen. It is here. Amen. It's gonna be here until God says otherwise. Amen. Because if, if if I close this down, then I'm disobedient. I'm rebelling and disobeying against the Lord. Mm-hmm. But what's God told you? Mm-hmm. God told you to be at this church. You better be at this church. Mm-hmm. Stop rebelling and disobeying and get your heart right. Mm-hmm. Get your heart right. Mm-hmm. Church again? No, you don't got to. You get to. That's right. That's right. Thank the Lord that you don't live in Russia or China and you're not in some underground church having to hide. Amen. Uh, come on. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah. Because there's some countries that, you know, you'll get persecuted if you're a Christian. Yeah. And yet we think, oh, I just want to sleep in. Really? Really? (laughs) Really? God sent his son Jesus to save you from eternal damnation. Not only that, he he did that so he could step into relationship with you and you were going to murmur and complain? Because you think you can't go to a baseball game when nobody's told you you couldn't do that. <laughs> Come on. Grow up. Amen. Tell that religion and tradition to go. Grow up. God's calling us to come up higher. Amen. Yes. Don't be like Saul, trying to justify and complain and blame everybody else. No, we we're responsible for our actions. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because so nobody's putting a gun to your head and forcing you to do the things that you're doing. Mm-hmm. 
And you know what? what? What would happen if that happened? What if somebody came in here and put a gun to your head and said, I want you to you know, deny Jesus, and then you'll live? You going to do that? No. no. Are you sure? Because you're not obeying the Lord in other things. So what makes you think you're going to do that? That's right. That's right. Huh? That's right. Come on now. I'm just speaking truth. Because we think we're going to do these things, and yet our heart's not right. We're not having a willing attitude. We're not having a humble attitude. And I would like to think that I would do that. But you know what? I don't know unless I'm in that situation. And just go, you know what? <laughs> yeah. I know where I'm going. I'm going to go to heaven. But you've got to live that life here. Amen. You can't just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I would. And you're not living a life of relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says to lay your, your, your life down for your brother. Mm -hmm. How many of you, I mean, I can honestly tell you I would lay my life down for you. I, I would push you out of the way, out of the way. You have. Mm-hmm. If, if the car was trying to come and get you, I would push you out of the way and I would take it for you. I remember one time, Carmen and I were on uh, a mission trip in Ohio and we're driving back and Daniel is sick and he's crying and we come in and he's crying and I busted through that house. I ran up to that room like that was my own child and scooped him up, took him downstairs and said, all right, take him to the hospital. <laughs> and for a minute, I said, okay, wait, he's not, he's not my son. <laughs> Here you go, mama. <laughs> like, you know, but we were speeding down that highway, and we were going, and it was like, you know, and Eric's just not knowing what to do. He's just like, oh, help me, because he had the other boys, you know, and it was just like, so I know it would be automatic. Amen. That's right. <laughs> But that's a lifestyle. That is a lifestyle of surrendering to Jesus Christ. Not getting your way, but doing it his way. Trust him. Obey him. Be willing to obey him. You know, seek the Lord. The Lord is having us at the end of this month really enter into prayer and fasting. Don't wait, but during that time, I really believe that God is going to start revealing things in people and start giving you answers to why things aren't working out so that you can make those adjustments and you can really enter into a deeper relationship with God. Because it's really easy for us to enter into religion and tradition, just come to church like it's just you know, our churchly duty. I went to church today, time card. <laughs> Here we go. No, God's not looking at that. He's not looking at whether you attend church. He's looking at your attitude in church. All right. Amen. Let me say that again. He's not looking at your attendance in church. He's looking at your attitude when you come to church. Amen. This is why God is talking about coming expecting. Come expecting God to speak to you and talk to you and show you things about yourself. Things that you never thought that you could do. Things that you go, oh, I gotta change that. But God, you're gonna help me change it, right? Yep, I'm right here. I'm with you all the way, baby. Mm -hmm. I got you. Mm -hmm. And He will take your hand and He will go with you. You yes. don't have to do it alone. And see, this is why we don't trust. This is why we don't obey because we think we gotta do it by ourselves. And we don't. That's right. We don't. He is with us. He said He would never leave us nor forsake us. That's right. But you gotta believe that. You gotta know that. You gotta know that you know that you know that God is for me. He is not against me. That He is with me all the time, and that He will give me the desires of my heart. There's still some things that I'm believing God for. They haven't come to pass, and there's no sign of them. But you know what? I see Him in the Spirit. I know God has spoken to me over and over again. Said, Melissa, they're coming. They're coming. Just, just stay on the path. Just stay on the path. And God is telling you this morning, get on the path. Yes. Stay on the path and get on the path and stay on the path. Get on the path, stay on the path. Get on the path, stay on the path. And we stay on the path through willingness and obedience. Amen. Amen. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Glory. Amen. Amen.